I'm Bill Boggs. Welcome back to Robin Leach's Talking Food. My introduction of our next guest, our, ba our major guest tonight, Peter Dushin. His life has been like a movie. In fact, it was part of a movie made in 1956 called The Eddie Dushin Story. Welcome, Peter Dushin. It's good to have you with us. It's great to be here. What is that disco music in the background? That, that's just part of the disco music. Why don't Are they you have allergic? something cool on this? Are you show? allergic to I mean, disco music? Disco music? For, yes, I am allergic this is a, to it's disco It's a retro music. show here. I, retro? Yes, we're disco retro Disco music died quite a while ago. I mean, you should should have some jazz, something very cool. Well, Why you can, disco? You can play. I don't know. I'm not the. I'm not actually oh, the disc okay. jockey for this, but Let's I'm, go on. I've been listening to a lot of James Brown recently. Tell you the truth. Very, I very love great. James. I Brown. love James Brown. That too. song, Aretha. Ain't, ain't that James a, Brown? Ain't that Wonderful. a groove? You know I love that. Yeah, I, I'm listening to a lot of that. I listen to a lot of Sinatra. And I listen to a lot of Rolling Stones. In fact, before I came here tonight, I was listening to the Rolling Stones song "Play with Fire" twice in a row. Wonderful. Oh, Rolling yeah. Stones. There was a funny thing. Mick Jagger, who is a, a, a good friend of mine, invited a bunch of sort of no, uh, New York social people to the last concert he had. At the Meadowlands. At the Meadowlands. Yeah, I saw that show. And they were to go to a party after the, uh, uh, after the concert, and the sort of advanced man said to this group that we're all in this clutch of people in this special box. Well, when he plays Brown Sugar, uh, then you all get up because that's, you know, two before the end. And so you, you get beat up the and, crowd. And you beat the yeah. crowd and stuff. And so these people who he'd invited said, which one's brown sugar? Oh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> you know? I don't and believe he, it. He played Jumping Jack Flash. Is that, is that, is that brown sugar? Yeah. Got They're it. Not, they weren't rocking out. Like, well, so you I would, don't you would... think those people rock out. I think uh, a few of them do. Well, what's Mick them. like up close? I was at a dinner party with him once a long time ago. It was very late at night, and <clears> we didn't have a lot to say to each other. But you're a friend of his. What's yes. Jagger like? I mean, He's he... very intelligent. Yeah. He's got terrific taste, a very good eye, and he has obviously a tremendous amount of energy and Ama amazing stamina i heard that he jogs and sings the songs as he runs and that's one of the well the i have a place in connecticut uh, a small country place and he rented a school a, a girl school that uh -huh. is now a cooking school funnily enough uh, and uh, for the summer in which to practice his act and they had a, a large sort of ballroom in the school and and he very interestingly enough he put uh, mirrors on the on the walls around this ballroom. Is it with all the stones there, or was it just Mick? No, it was all of them. All of them. And okay. they all had sort of houses around. And there was this little, I mean, this is kind of a farm community. And uh, Jagger was, you know, doing his act in this, and he was working, and we saw him, and he couldn't have been nicer. But uh, the New York Times was very interested in the fact that Mick Jagger was in Washington, Connecticut, uh, which is this little in this country girl's town, school, right? In this girls' school, doing his act, and so therefore, Times reporters would come up, and there was this little place, a kind of a luncheonette, uh -huh. uh, just a, a kind of place where all the farmers would come and have a tuna yeah. fish salad, or, you know, whatever. For Mick lunch. would be there having his and no, sugar not now. at all. And and the Times people would go up to these guys, and say, anybody seen Mick <laughs> Jagger? Or roll it. And it these, and like these old Yankees would turn around and say, if I see another Rolling Stone, I'll kick his ass down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or something like that. I mean, but, you know, it was, they were not impressed. But you were impressed. You liked I it. am but, impressed. You know, it's I think the Rolling Stones is a great group. But you're, you're a wonderful musician, and you're trained at the best schools in, in the world. Your father, Eddie Duchin, was an acclaimed pianist and a band leader in, in really another era. In, in, in New York, in, in, well, sl slightly in, before in, me, in the yeah. 30s and, and in the 40s. So people wouldn't associate you with rock and roll, but that's great. That you, if you like music, you like music, but you don't like disco. Disco's thin, too disco thin. Disco to me is very, it's sort of obvious. How about rap? Uh, I am not, I don't like rap. I like two or three rap songs, and then it all sounds the same to me. Well, to me it sounds the same. I think it's, I like poetry, and I think that it's kind of, uh, not very good poetry. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you. The, the, the Eddie, I, to take a moment and tell the Eddie Duchin story. We have a, cl a couple of clips from the movie, as you know. <coughs> tell but me. I, well, the, 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 our talent coordinator who called you and was talking to you didn't know the Eddie Duchin story. Yeah, so which was assume, great. But she did know Tyrone Power. She knew Tyrone Power. <laughs> so tell, tell folks a little bit about the, the Eddie Genesis. Duchin story. Yeah, okay. And then we'll show a clip. Eddie Duchin, who was my father, uh, came to New York from Boston in 1929 and got a job in a place which was the most wonderful, beautiful, uh, select, 
uh, place in New York called the Tavern on the Green. Well, called actually at that time the Central Park Casino. Central Park Casino. And the Central Park Casino was on the east side, not where the Tavern on the Green is now. Hmm. The Tavern on the Green is on the west side. Right. Central Park Casino is basically where the zoo is today, a mm -hmm. little, little above it. And Dad had a uh, tremendously important part in a band that played there. This was a place where people would come up in carriages and wearing white tie and tails and stuff like that. And it was the most glamorous, wonderful place. People don't dress like that in the park at night anymore. Not anymore. Not really. No, God knows what would happen. So you're, Maybe the muggers should dress that way. So what was fa no. what's fascinating about this is that, that your father's story actually was, was made into this movie. It was in made into a movie. In 1956. And, and he died, you see, yeah. uh, at a very young age. He was 41. He was a huge star. He had been a great great uh, 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 person in the in the war. He fought overseas in Normandy and, and in Iwo Jima and, and uh, the man was a great man. And, and he died and, when I was 13. And your mother died in childbirth. My dad, mother died in ch childbirth and I'm writing a book about it. Well that's going to be, I'm in, interested in the book. Here's a clip from the movie. Well, I am the Eddie, too. The Eddie Dujan story with Tyrone Power playing your dad. No, more importantly. Kim Novak playing my but mom. But she's not in this clip, unfortunately. Oh, darn. But this is after he comes back from the war, and you have a budding musical talent, and you're attending one of his rehearsals, and this is what happens. <laughs> from your past. And that was Rex Thompson playing, playing you. Playing me. A little boy and his career piano. went totally down, down now, did that like happen? a stone. Did that happen in real life? Was it really a scene like that where no. you attend? So that's part of the dra dramatization. That was, uh, yeah, I think, you know, to make a movie about somebody's life, you have to dramatize it. Right. You have to make it into the kind of melodrama that they did. In this case, it was a very plausible scene. I did play the piano with uh -huh. Dad sometimes. Mm -hmm. But this was kind of uh, interesting, right. this scene. I liked it. Well, you're going to play the piano after we take a break. We'll take a break. Sound nice. Our guest is Peter Dushin. He's playing My Heart Stood Still. Why don't we just listen? Sing it to Now you go ahead.
it's not Thank disco. You. No, it's not disco. <laughs> you know, I agree with you. I'm not defending our disco theme. We need we need more jazz like theme. A little bass. Don't perhaps, you think? A little, yeah, uh, maybe a, bass, a nice nice little guitar, tenor sax, guitar, and a piano. Piano, <laughs> of course. <laughs> with you at the keyboard. Now you played all over the world. Have you? Worked at the White House much? I played at the White House so many times that I can tell you that the piano there is unbelievable. It's got, it's this huge Steinway piano right. that was given, obviously, by the first Steinway to get it out of his house because it has. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's got right here on, on the on the legs. It's got these two huge eagles, you know, mm -hmm. sort of. And uh, uh, I mean, you walk over to it, and it's so intimidating. But it is such an honor to play there. I was playing there once and uh, for Jimmy Carter. Right. You remember him? Yes, I right. do. Okay. He's sort of the quasi-Secretary of State. That's the one, the guy the who state. does all the stuff I hope that the Newt others doesn't fire. Him. It's the one that, that yes. Well, Newt, yes. He we'll doesn't. get into Newt. We we'll get into, into let's The do next Newt segment, later. we'll talk Newt. But Jimmy Carter asked us to play uh, for uh, the governor's uh, convention uh -huh. that he was having there. And he had all the governors there. And he asked me to play uh, cocktails before with a trio and then go into dinner and then play for the governor's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ball, whatever it was. So I'm playing for cocktails, you know, <laughs> playing away. And people are standing around the piano, Jay Rockefeller, a bunch of people, friends. And all of a sudden I hear this sound, which is, soup song. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the president. Suits that, on. Well, he was very uh, informal. Yeah, I, I guess so. You know, I mean, if right. you wanted a drink there, I mean, you had to drink some dreadful wine that was, well, uh, if that. Anyway, the president said soups on, and so that meant go into the next room. Right. And all of a sudden, as people were filing in, I noticed the, the fact that the people around me were in, just in hysterics. And I said, what are you laughing at? And they said, what are you playing, you idiot? And I was playing, send in the clowns. <laughs> and all the governors. <laughs> Isn't it rich? Isn't it true? And they all filed in, oh, right? I mean, really there funny. they were. And uh, we were in hysteria. But the White House was, uh, is a place that is filled with such memories, obviously, uh, and so much history. Uh, it's a wonderful place. I wonder the idea of Barbara Streisand sleeping the night in Lincoln's bedroom is a curious one. Well, it? the interesting thing about that was, according to the papers, that Hillary wasn't in Washington at the time. Ah. That's what makes that such an interesting story. Ooh. You heard it here third. Ooh. Now, the first song you said. People. You <laughs> That's right. Yes. People who need presidents. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, the first song you played was My Heart Stood Still. Yes. A beautiful song. Um, I Rogers and Hart. Rogers yeah. and Hart. What would you like to do now? Well, my favorite song is All the Things You Are. Uh, Jerome Kern? Jerome Kern, very good. Thank and it you. was his last tune. Last tune he wrote. Uh, so, so I don't know the words of it. You are the promised gift of springtime. What a beautiful line that is. Why is he singing this? Thing? No, I was reciting it. I don't know. Them. No wonder there's disco at the time. <laughs>
indeed, a beautiful song. Peter, we'll resume our interview, our conversation later. Just uh, play us out with something, if you will, please. I love that song. That is a gorgeous song. Uh, to continue our conversation, now, one thing I'd be curious, with a father who is such a famous musician, right? You obviously showed great talent at an early age. Was it your destiny, really, to do what you're doing today? No, it was, I think, a destiny to do something in the, in the field of music. Right. Not necessarily uh, playing for dancing and playing concerts and the things I do. I play jazz, I, I studied music, and I always wanted to be a musician. I think the one thing I was sorry that I never, if looking back, yeah. the thing I'm sorry that I never did was take conducting more seriously. Huh. But I don't think I was really, when I was younger, I wasn't that sure of myself. I mean, to be a conductor, you've got to walk in to a bunch of people and say, this You're is the way it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, this is the way it's going to be. And you all have to know how <clears throat> every instrument works. Yes, you, yes. but that yes. I could have learned. Right. But, but the idea of, of not caring if they hated me yeah. <laughs> right. it's a big yeah. thing about it. So I'm writing a book about that. And um, uh, the book is really about how I tried to figure myself out and how things were different during the time that my father played and the time that I've been playing. That's the truth. I mean, it, it, it is totally Because there's such different. a different life today. I mean, society is so different. The people I play for dress so differently. Uh, for instance, I started, uh, well, when I started my career professionally at the St. Regis in 1962. The Masonette, right? At the Masonette, yeah, uh, which was downstairs. I mean, people were so different. Then and 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 the well, people. Well, how 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 were they? Well, they were elegant. They wore jewelry. Now they think they're going to be ripped off if they walk with jewelry, so mm -hmm. they don't have jewelry. I mean, people were not. Uh, they were from old families. People that came to that evening were people that had a certain culture and a certain uh, bearing and a certain uh, well, uh, knowledge of what they were doing. I played for the refurbishment of the St. Regis a couple of years ago, which was a wonderful party. Oh, it was given by the, by the Preservation Society, mm -hmm. which is a sensational group uh, mm -hmm. in New York, a very important group. And I played for that, and, and it was a very different type of... Well, it all got blown out in the 60s. I yeah, mean, it just changed in I the I think 60s. the 60s changed, and then the 80s changed that again, mm -hmm. where... All of a sudden, under the Reagan administration, uh, one half of one percent of the population started making huge money. Yeah. Unbelievable money. It, it took no background to make that money. It took a sort of an intelligence to work with figures. What, what's your feeling today, uh, as we know, for, for the first time in 40 years, the Republicans have control of Congress. 40 years ago, you know, rock and roll was invented 40 years ago, so it doesn't right. mean, you know, that, that everything is going to be... Are you be saying rock and roll was invented under the uh, Republican... Under the Republican Congress, rock you mean, and roll Are you telling me that Little Richard was a Republican? Little Richard no, right, played... Yeah, great. While, right. while Eisenhower was a Republican, <laughs> they had a Republican Congress, yeah, okay. so we shouldn't think, you know, no, that, that everything agree. is going to be just no, smooth, I, silly. No, as a matter of fact... What do you think about this? As a matter of fact, I am the Vice Chairman of the New York State Council on the Arts. I know. That who started the New York State Council on the Arts? Nelson Rockefeller. Rockefeller, right. And it was started before the National Endowment. Right. And the National Endowment was started after that. Mm -hmm. And it was the model for the National Endowment for the Arts. What's your objective? I mean, as a vice chairman of New York State Council <clears throat> of the Arts, what, is, what do you try to do? And what's your feeling about all the talk of trimming, trimming, trimming that we hear coming? I from feel the arts are absolutely essential in a civilization that is trying to make any sense of itself. Yeah. I think it is the thing that the civilization is going to leave behind, that has any enduring value. I think that the government should absolutely support the arts, having in, as, as an avenue of support a group like the National Endowment, which is a terribly important and well thought out Quite conservative group. But don't they always get it? I mean, in every year, the national they're always they always pick step in something. Whether it's Maplethorpe. But, but wait you know, a minute. There's all, the, and then and then Helms or somebody goes crazy, and then and then there's, it's on the front pages. The, for, yes, but the, it's always one teeny little that, thing. I, but it, I mean, it seems of like that's the only of, thing. Out of yeah. thousands of things that the endowment is supported, right. out of thousands of things that we as a, a New York State. Council have supported. You don't know how carefully vetted these things well, are, how carefully scrutinized these things are. Yeah. But let's say 
Let me give you the argument. Let's say that you are the head of an organization that presents interesting things by interesting artists. Okay. Let's say you're the head of the Corker Museum, which was the one that the Maple Maplethorpe. Thorpe, yeah. Okay, and let's say that you are the organization supporting a very great photographer, Maplethorpe, mm -hmm. which he was. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yes, and, and, uh, absolutely. Okay. And, now, and his work will, will, will absolutely be vocative of the time that he was in, which exactly. is what an artist is all about. Couldn't agree with you more. So let's say the National Endowment says to the Corcoran, who says they want an exhibition of Maplethorpe, great. We've seen his work. It's terrific. Uh -huh. Now, they give X amount of money to that. The, the Corcoran says, great. But the pictures that are chosen... Somebody's not happy with. because Somebody is not happy with. Right. And that somebody is from North Carolina, and now the head of your foreign relations committee, our foreign I, I relations know that. committee, well, look, which is one of the scariest things that I can we only possibly have a, We think only have of. a minute here, or th actually 30 seconds. With all the to we're hearing talking about are, uh, privatization, <laughs> cutting back, what do you think will happen? Look, look into the future a year. Do you think we're really going to... Let's put it this way. The most important thing not to happen is to cut back on support for the arts, because the arts are absolutely the most important thing that this society has to offer. And there are so many burgeoning artists out there, so many artists that need support. This is of paramount importance. And what do you say to the person says, well, why do we need taxpayer money to do that? I because mean, taxpayer money means that the taxpayers will get back. Back. Get back. Get back. Sounds like the Beatles. Get back. Get, get back. back. Get back to where you want. You got it. We All got right. It.